So the, the sermon text for tonight is actually what we just sung, Psalm 1. Um, I'm tempted to say, well, we've sung it, so we won't read it, but it's a bit hard to talk about delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating on it day and night and then not just want to read it again. So turn with me to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 1. Um, with Logan away preaching at that camp, um, you get me both leading and preaching tonight. So if you were sick of me already, I'm sorry. But I pray that God will speak to you through, through his word tonight. Let's read it. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree, planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Thus far, God's word. I read a a quote last week um, by John Piper. He said, Satan devotes 168 hours a week, that's all of the time, trying to deceive you. He says, do you think you can maintain a renewed mind with a 10-minute glance at God's book once a day? Ouch. (laughs) Jai and I talked about that, and um, it got us us thinking about, you know, how many words do we really hear in a a week or a day? And so I, I looked that up. And I read a statistic which said that research suggests that the average person hears between 20,000 and 30,000 words during the course of a a 24-hour period. So that would be 140 to 210,000 words a week. And that same article also said that listening to, to nagging or complaining for 30 minutes or more, 30 minutes, can cause damage to the part of your brain that handles problem-solving skills. So, so if you put that all together, right, you see that the words that we hear, as little as 500 words, and not even that we're like actively thinking about, just passively hearing, make physical changes to the neural pathways in our brains and change the way we think and understand the world. And we hear approximately 200,000 words a week. And most of them, deceptive. Well, what are we going to do about that? How do we fight back against that? How are we going to, to win in this war of words? Well, this evening, we will see in Psalm 1 that God's word is our salvation. It always has been, it is today, and it always will be. So let's pray that he would speak through his word tonight. Lord, we we come before you again as we have have read your word. We we pray as we come to this time, Lord, that you would speak to us. Speak through me, I pray. Use me. Well, we've just just heard that so much of, of what we hear in a week is trying to tear us away from you and deceive us. And so, Lord, we pray that your word would be powerful tonight. Lord, that you would use it to to transform and renew our minds, to make us more and more into our Savior Christ. So we ask this, even tonight, Lord, would you speak to us? Would you change us for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen. So God's word is, is our salvation. 
It always has been. Uh, the, the book of Psalms, as we, as we have it in our Bibles, um, is a, a compilation of, of praise songs and poetry, which was put together in the way that it is around the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Which means that by, the time, by that time, God's people had been in hostile captivity for generations. You can imagine how much of what they would be hearing would be bad news. You know, right? our, our army's been defeated, our city's been destroyed, the temple is in ruins, our people are being slaughtered. God has given up on us. Many are, are turning away. They would be tempted to feel hopeless. You can imagine how many of those things that they'd be hearing would be deceptive as their captors lorded over them. Our gods are stronger than yours. They'd be tempted towards idolatry. And they would be tempted towards apostasy. Just giving up on God altogether because it seems like he's given up on us. And so you can just imagine this, this picture of, of national, even international as they're scattered among the nations, this huge scale crisis of faith, as these people live in, in, in hopelessness amongst idolatry and tempted to give up on, on God. And, and into this, this picture of brokenness, this picture of faithlessness, this picture of hopelessness comes God's word as salvation. This, this book of Psalms compiled together to bring hope. If you were going to compile a book of poetry to bring hope in a situation like that, how would, how would you, what would you put first? How would you start it? The book of Psalms opens like this. In Psalm 1, book 1, chapter 1, verse 1, blessed is the man. Imagine that. In all of this, this depressing talk of, of curses and punishments, God speaks of one who is blessed. And it, it goes on and tells us about this blessed man. It, it paints a word picture of hope and faithfulness. Blessed is the man. He's, this guy's got it sorted. Look at this guy. He's, he's got it made. How fortunate is, is this person? You know, put, put their poster on your wall. Follow them on Instagram. Subscribe to them on YouTube. Pre-order their book. Do whatever they tell you because this kind of person is who you want to be. Blessed is this man. And what is his secret? Well, he walks not in the counsel of the wicked. That's a, a figure of speech in Hebrew for taking advice. right? So hearing someone's counsel and then walking in it means taking their advice. He doesn't take the wrong advice. Not our guy. No way. And what else? He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. Again, standing in the way of someone means something different in Hebrew than it does in English. Um, in Hebrew, it's, it's about their, their way of life, standing in that. Um, if you have an NIV, you'll see that it says uh, keeping in step with sinners. He doesn't keep in step with sinners, which sort of captures that idea. So he doesn't stand in or, or do things their way. Right? He doesn't live a sinful lifestyle. No way. Not our guy. Not this guy. What else? Nor does he sit in the seat of scoffers. If there was a, a group of scoffers or mockers here tonight, they would all be sitting at the back there somewhere so that they can kind of lean back and laugh and mock. Or I guess if they were really bold, they would sit right up the front so that they could throw popcorn. Our guy's not like that. He doesn't sit with, with the mockers. He doesn't sit in their seat. He doesn't come with that kind of attitude to things. He's got the right attitude. He's here to learn. He's here to grow. So he doesn't take the wrong advice. He doesn't live a sinful lifestyle. He doesn't have a rebellious attitude. He rejects the, the worldly and the wicked, the the deceptive and the devilish. 
And instead, we read in verse 2 that his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. What a, a picture of faithfulness. In the midst of, of failing faith, in the midst of hopelessness, in steps this, this hero of a man to inspire us in his wisdom and in his action and his attitude. This guy is the man. Put his poster on your wall. This is, this is who you want to be like. And this, this word picture goes on to tell us that there is still a reward for a righteous person like this. Verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now, remember, this is important, right? When a lot of what you hear is that God is punishing you, that you are being cursed, to know that in the midst of that, that it's still possible to be blessed, that it's still worthwhile to be faithful, that would be huge. And then in, in verses 4 to 6, it shows that the success of the wicked is temporary. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I imagine too, an Israelite in exile, these conquering empires who are in control, they would they'd be forced to live under. They would have seemed like unstoppable forces, right? Too big to fail. They'd surely be around forever. And instead, God says, no. The wicked are like, like the husks of wheat at threshing time that just blow away in the wind. They're insignificant. They're, they're temporary. They're nothing. Don't worry about it. So in the midst of exile to a, a scattered group of oppressed refugees, God's word comes as salvation to his people. Like water to a parched tongue, like lotion to dry cracking skin. God's word is their salvation. But there is a big problem with the psalm. Who of us here can say that this description of the blessed man fits us? Well, I know I can't. I bet you can't. This, this description of the blessed man, it doesn't fit us. We, we don't do the things that he does. We, we do do the things that he doesn't do. I mean, he, he, he walks not in the counsel of, of the wicked, but we walk amid wrong advice every day. And just think of it, all of the wrong advice that you hear. I mean, do this, don't do that. Shop here, give us your money. Your time is valuable, spend it on this. You're not wearing that, are you? You'll never get these things. You know, this is what you want. You're no one if you don't have these things. You really need more money. You really need more things. Well, you really need a holiday. You need to eat healthier. You need to eat more. You're looking skinny. Perhaps you need to eat a little bit less. Have you thought about a gym membership? You should, you should read more. You should watch more. You should play more. You should follow your dreams. Follow your heart. Follow me. I mean, <laughs> just, we're surrounded by it. We're bombarded with with wicked counsel. I mean, not all of it is, is wicked, but how do you tell the difference? We take it all the time. We're deceived and led astray. He doesn't, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor does he stand in the way of sinners. But our lifestyles are, are plagued with sin, aren't they? Now, so much of what we do and interact with is designed to addict us. You know, think about the fact that our hearts, that we just become addicted to things at the drop of a hat. You know, food, caffeine, money, entertainment, pornography, people's praise, likes on Facebook, relationships, the Rugby World Cup, all sorts of things. Before we know it, we, we find that our whole way of life centers around these things. We look to them for our satisfaction, for our hope, for our joy, for our meaning. 
We also read that he doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers, but we find ourselves scoffing at even the idea of spending more time with God and his word. This description, it, it doesn't match us. We are not this blessed person. Nobody has our poster on their wall. And so we cannot expect the reward, right? I mean, he's, he's a tree planted by streams of water. That's a, a picture of longevity and health and well-being. We can't expect to be like that. We are not this blessed person. But if we're not the, the blessed one, then we, we must be the wicked. Verse 4, the wicked are, are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Worthless, insignificant, good for nothing, irrelevant. Every Gen Z is for most hated words. Irrelevant. And wickedness ends in death. We see that in verses 5 and 6. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So, so this word picture, which, which looked so promising, it looks so good, it looks so hopeful. It's not enough for us to be saved. We need something more than a picture. I mean, who, who is this blessed man? He's not me. He's not you. He's not us. The word picture is not enough. We need the picture to be real. And John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and and truth. I'm going to let that sink in a little bit. The Word became flesh. The Word picture, this blessed man, is Jesus. He lived the righteous life. He walked not in the counsel of the wicked. I mean, again and again in the Gospels, we, we see Jesus never took the wrong advice, even though he was given heaps of it. You know, make yourself some bread, Jesus. Just turn a stone into some bread. Throw yourself off a building, Jesus. Angels will catch you. People will love it. Don't hang out with those people, Jesus. They make you look bad. Call down fire on those towns, Jesus. They disrespected you. Go up to the feast, Jesus. Show off your skills. You're trying to build a kingdom, aren't you? Get us off these crosses, Jesus. Save yourself and us. Will you restore the kingdom to Israel now, Jesus? I mean, that's what we're here for. After all, our kingdom come, right? He never took the wrong advice. Instead, we can read in Hebrews 4. Can you turn with me to Hebrews 4? Uh, Church Bible, that's page 1003. One thousand and two, but Hebrews four, verse fifteen. It says, "For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin." God was tempted as we are in every respect. He faced all of the wrong advice that we face and more. Yet he was without sin. He never gave in to any of it. He walked not in the counsel of the wicked. Nor did he stand in the way of sinners. In all of his actions and his interactions, Jesus never sinned. He, he even surrounded himself with sinful people, but he never adopted their sinful lifestyle. Instead, Romans 8 verse 3, you're going to turn there with me. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, that's on page 100, 944. This is this. Romans 8, verse 3, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his 
own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. So Jesus, though he came into our, our world, though he surrounded himself with sinners just like you and me, he was yet without sin. their lifestyles didn't rub off on him. I mean, instead, his lifestyle rubbed off on them. What else? Nor did he sit in the seat of scoffers. You know, he never developed a rebellious attitude to the will of his father. Even in the, the Garden of Gethsemane, when he sweated blood in anxiety over what he was being called to do, he remained submissive to the master plan even to the point of death. First uh, Peter 2, if you want to turn there, it tells us, First Peter 2, that's verses 22 and 23 are on page 1015. First Peter 2, 22 and 23. He committed no sin, neither was deceit, found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He never developed a mocking, rebellious attitude. He never sat in the seat of scoffers. He entrusted himself to God who judges justly. So going back to Psalm 1, We've seen that Jesus walked not in the counsel of the wicked. He stood not in the way of sinners. He sat not in the seat of scoffers. And also his delight was in the law of the Lord. From a, a young age, we see him interacting with the scribes in the temple. Uh, you can read about that in Luke chapter 2. He, he meditated on it day and night. You can see that it was the first thing on his mind, the first thing on his tongue when people asked him questions was, was God's word, right? He faced the devil with Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. He, he faced the Sadducees with Exodus 3, 6. He faced the Pharisees with Psalm 110 verse 1. He was, he was saturated in the Bible. And he fulfilled that law perfectly. So he is, in every way, the perfect picture of a righteous life. So no one deserves the blessing of the psalm more than Jesus, right? No one deserves more than Jesus to prosper in all that he does. No one deserves more than Jesus to have a long, fruitful, healthy life, to be like a tree planted by streams of water. But he didn't get that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's been a, a switch has happened. Jesus lived the righteous life and got the wicked ending. We who live that Wicked life can have the ending of the righteous. Jesus got the wicked ending. Jesus was treated like chaff that the wind drives away. He, he lost his followers. He was irrelevant. He was treated as unwanted, left to die on a cross. Jesus faced the Father's judgment and was killed for our wickedness. So though he was righteous in everything he said and did and thought, he perished for the ways of wicked people like you and me. And why? Well, at least in part, so that we can have the reward that we read about in Psalm 1. Though we deserve nothing, we become blessed. Though we've done all of these things that we shouldn't, Jesus' perfect life of, of discernment and obedience, it becomes ours. Though we have failed 
to delight in the law of the Lord and we've failed to keep it, Jesus has fulfilled the law on our behalf. And though we deserve nothing but to be blown away like chaff, instead we look forward to a future when like trees planted by streams of water, we will enjoy eternal life in paradise. We, we will prosper in all that we do. We will stand in the judgment though we deserve to fall. We will be among the congregation of the righteous, covered in the righteousness of Christ. And the Lord, verse 6, will watch over us with loving care and protection for ages and ages and ages as we enjoy the blessing of his presence. The word of God, the word become flesh, is our salvation. But not just, not just then, right? Not just when we die. Because Christ rose from death and poured out his life-giving spirit on the church. And because we are united with Christ, not just in the future, but now, tonight. The word picture of Psalm 1 is a picture of the life that he is producing in you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Christian. Blessed are you because the Holy Spirit is working in you. Little by little. Day by day. More and more. To, to grow your discernment. So that you are able to distinguish good from evil. Hebrews 5.14. And no longer walk in the counsel of the wicked. And blessed are you because the grace of God is training you to renounce ungodliness and, and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. That's Titus 2 verses 11 through 14. So it's saying you are no longer enslaved to your old lifestyle. You don't have to stand in the way of sinners. And blessed are you because the mercy of the triune God is changing your heart and renewing your mind so that you are no longer a rebel against him, but a disciple of him. Romans 12, 2. Your attitude has changed from mocking Jesus to treasuring Jesus. You no longer sit in the seat of scoffers. Blessed are you because your delight in the incarnate word is slowly but surely eclipsing your delight in the carnal world. You are like a tree planted by streams of water. Because the water that Jesus gives you is becoming a spring of water welling up inside you to eternal life. John 4.14 4, and because you have heard the word and accepted it, you will bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold, Mark 4.20. And though you face trials of various kinds, you will not wither. Because you know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, Romans 8.28. So really, in all that you do, you prosper. So this, this word picture becomes a picture of the life that Jesus is producing in you. Isn't, isn't this what you long to be? To be like this person who's described in Psalm 1. And how amazing would it be for us, all of us, to be a community of people like this? Right? Who, who meditate on God's word, who, who marinate in it, who study it and memorize it and recite it to ourselves. Who have our delight and our desires in the right places, in Jesus, and who draw deeply from the life-giving stream that is Christ himself. How much would that change who we are, this community, our witness, our outreach? God's word is our salvation. It was in the past, it will be in the future, and he is even today. 
So as we think about going back to work tomorrow, going back to, oh yeah, true, Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but as we think about going back to our lives, right? Let's live out this life that we see described here. Let's meditate on the law of the Lord. Let's delight in it. Let's go knowing that we are blessed. Let's be healthy, fruit-bearing Christians. Let's offer Jesus' life-giving water to others so that they can experience what we have experienced, this blessing that we, we know in Christ. Let us together live out this blessed life that we have been given. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, you are, you are the blessed man. You are the hero that has stepped into our hopeless situation. You are the one we look to, but not only as an example, because you lived and died and poured out your spirit, Lord, that we would be able to claim your righteousness, be able to claim the good that you did, be able to claim the evil that you avoided, even though our lives look nothing like this a lot of the time. Lord, we thank you so much that we are clothed in your righteousness. We thank you that we can, we can claim the psalm. We can say that we are blessed. All because of what you have done and are doing in us and through us. Yet not us, but through Christ in us. Lord, we thank you that we have such confidence to be able to make such bold claims about ourselves because of you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to live it out. Pray that you truly would help us to desire and delight in your word. Pray that you would help us to grow in, in discernment and wisdom. Lord, that we'd be able to know good advice from bad advice to know a sinful lifestyle from a godly one, to know a, a rebellious, mocking attitude from an attitude of, of submission to you and trust in your goodness. Lord, would you make us more and more like this picture that we see? Would you make us more and more like this blessed man? And help us to share this blessing with others. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you have blessed us so abundantly. And that we can look forward to this happy ending where we stand among the congregation of the righteous and we experience your, your love and your care as we drink from the streams of living water. Thank you for the great hope that we have. And all in Jesus' name. Amen.